Hello there, welcome back to Talking Europe on France 24. Now, in part one of our programme, we heard from the President of Latvia. And in this part of the show, it's the Foreign Minister of neighbouring Lithuania, who is our guest, Linus Linkavičius. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. Now, um, I'm going to give some key facts to our viewers uh, to start things off, as we did uh, in the previous part of the programme. Uh, so Lithuania uh, gained its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. Today, it has a population of 2.8 million people. It's been a member of the European Union and of NATO since 2004 and a member of the Eurozone since 2015. Another key fact, Vilnius is actually the closest EU capital to Moscow uh, geographically and as a former Soviet Republic, relations with Russia are often very much on Lithuanian minds. Uh, now, you yourself, Mr. Likovic, uh, you said in an interview recently that threats from Russia are real and should be taken seriously. You're here in Paris as part of a visit, including going to the Paris Peace Forum. So I want to start off with that security theme. Uh, what kind of what kind of threats are you talking about, these real threats? No, threats are not, nece not necessarily conventional, as we understand, missiles, tanks, you know. Uh, we also living in the modern world, and there are so-called asymmetric or hybrid threats, you can call them whatever you like, but they are, you know, cyber, uh, information, uh, energy. Mm. So we're living in this age, and we have to really take these uh, challenges seriously. Is, uh, is Lithuania particularly vulnerable, so considering its small size? I believe we are exposed, really. Mm. Until recently, we were really like an uh, island of uh, energy, in, in bad terms, uh, with regard to the energy supplies. Until the end of 2014, we built LNG terminal in our seaport, so we changed substantially the situation, also in the region, not only for my country. Now, when, uh, when it comes to the cyber, every country exposed for the uh, threats, and probably it's not an exception for Lithuania. Mm. We're taking very seriously, and we're leading uh, even in the uh, European Union defense cooperation, PESCO, so-called PESCO, you know, we're leading uh, cyber defense rapid reaction teams, so uh, specializing on these issues. And strategic communication or uh, counter propaganda, whatever you can call it, it's really working quite actively. And I have to say that our public uh, society is very active, not just government. We have platforms which are debunking fake news in the real time as we speak. From Russia? Not only. Uh, we, the platform called debunk.eu, uh, they're working in three languages, Lithuanian, English and Russian, and debunking around uh, 30,000 articles per day uh, with the artificial intelligence, IT solutions, and volunteers working every day. So, I mean, this is really resilience because it's uh, good that you know the, the term, but mm. it's, uh, if it's not filled with the substance, not very good. So if, it's, if it's handled just by government, also not very good. If it's uh, society if it is engaged, I believe this is really something. So we are ready to share with others this experience, which is becoming more and more important. That sounds like a huge operation. Let's uh, look at the geopolitical level of things. Uh, Europe and the United States uh, relations with Russia. Uh, I've got a report for us to watch together. Now, I know you were in Berlin just recently for the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Also, Mike Pompeo, US Secretary of State. Uh, he had somewhat of a tough message uh, to give while he was there, saying that the Cold War may be over, but relations between the West and Russia for him are in the freezer. This from James Wilson. America's top diplomat Mike Pompeo unveiling a statue of former U.S. President Ronald Reagan. The spot symbolic, close to where Reagan told Gorbachev to tear down the Berlin Wall 30 years ago. An appropriate city then for Pompeo to deliver his own tough message on Russia. Today, Russia, led by a former KGB officer stationed in Dresden, invades its neighbors and slays political opponents. His host, Chancellor Merkel, assured her guests that Germany would be a constructive global partner and thanked America for helping transform her country. Americans and Germans have become close partners and close friends. The United States of America helped Germany achieve its reunification thanks to the efforts of George Bush and others. That's something that we will never forget. Pompeo spent two full days in Germany, an unusually long trip for the U.S. Secretary of State, and a testament to the importance America places on its relationship with Berlin. That relationship may sometimes be strained by Merkel and Trump's lack of personal chemistry, but whatever the personalities involved, the two countries share close ties. 
So there we go. Uh, we heard Mike Pompeo speaking out against Russia there. But it's not actually that long, just a few weeks, really, since Emmanuel Macron said that the West needs to rethink its relations with Russia. Do you agree with him or with Mike Pompeo? I would say that Russia must rethink relations with the rest of the world because there are rules, uh, international law, and everyone needs to comply with the law. If somebody looks for some exceptions, caveats, or special case uh, solutions, this is a problem. So when I'm asked uh, what we did in order to improve relations with Russia, I'm always asking what we did. Mm. Uh, did we invade uh, Crimea? Did we annex 20% of uh, Georgian territory? Uh, was that Salisbury attack also behind us or something? What, what we did wrong in order to improve? So this is something else. And we shouldn't uh, take responsibility for these relations and the status. We have to stay quite firm on, as I said, commitments, rules, values, principles. If we'll retreat, will be more problems in the future, simply. It will be a short-sighted strategy because somebody thinks that we will be cooperative or flexible, other side will do the same. But unfortunately, other side taking this as a weakness and continuing this policy, which is not always very rational. You think Russia would take advantage if the West were to give... Uh, I know, because it was many times before. You remember war in South Caucasus in 2008? You probably remember in your programs uh, reaction and was very right and very clear and tough reaction. But very soon we came back to business as usual and it looked like, uh, well, it's a, like, so to say, new normal. It's exactly what our opponents sometimes w want to do. I'm, I'm not saying against Russians. I'm not uh, trying to, well, offend uh, artificially. I'm just trying to ask ourselves, are we really consistent enough ourselves? Are we really, uh, well, uh, conducting uh, along the lines we just agreed uh, among mm. us? Uh, or are we simply simply closing eyes to what is happening, uh, wishing that there uh, will be some illusion mm. to improve relations? This is really a very big, big discussion, but uh, mm. I believe we have to take it. Well, one major discussion is uh, what to do about the sanctions that the EU imposed on Russia in 2014. Uh, they're up for renewal again in uh, January coming up. Uh, what's your position? You know, it's, it, it is the only leverage we're using. If we get a menu of measures uh, to, to pressure, uh, then we can discuss. But it's the only one. So if we'll uh, put aside the only one, that would be mean that we're retreating and coming really to back to normal. Uh, and it was not first in the history, not first time. So I believe that would be really very uh, bad and lamentable. I hope it will not happen. But uh, we're always discussing these issues, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid that we should, we should really take more time to do that because we still do not have strategy on Russia. Mm. We do not know, we do not have agreement what we'd like to achieve. Uh, is it partnership, strategic partnership, just co cohabitation or, or, or re-education of our partners? I don't know. Uh, what is the purpose, but uh, the mess, most, so to say, component of this dialogue should be, as I said, principles on which we are laying the foundation of our relationship. If we'll retreat, uh, that would mean that foundation will be ruined uh, eventually, which is definitely uh, not along uh, the lines of our thinking. So you're thinking we, that the West needs new ideas when it comes to the relationship with Russia? Let's stick to, to old ideas. Let's, let's stick to, to agreed policies. That's the point. You know, uh, I, I believe Ru Russia also, they are quite uh, well practical and they are taking clear messages. If message is clear, uh, maybe they will change something. Mm. If it's not clear, sometimes ambiguous. It's taken, as I said, as a weakness, even as a provocation. When you say ambiguous, do you, do you mean talking about splits uh, within European leaders? For example, Viktor Orban saying that he thinks Russia shouldn't be provoked. He's talking about loosening those sanctions. I exactly what I'm saying. Uh, when we are commenting, you know, uh, well, Russia tries. It's not a big secret to divide us, to split, uh, to make us to, in groups. Good, good, so to see, bunch of countries. Uh, some are bad, and uh, I'm afraid my country belongs to the latter group, which is really not the case. We'd like to have good relations with our neighbors. Uh, we are not stupid people. We, we want to have normal relations. But as I said, uh, if we'll really close eyes to what is happening wrong, I believe it will be really uh, counterproductive for the future. This brings us on to the subject of NATO. Uh, the current defense minister of uh, Lithuania said NATO needs strong deterrence policy in the Baltic specifically. But coming back to the French president once again, President Macron recently criticised NATO and said that he'd lost faith in the organisation. Uh, what do you make of those comments? Are you losing faith as well? <laughs> Look, uh, this organisation uh, was always having some well, situation where we're difficult. 
uh, even crisis. And by the way, let's, let's mention when France left the military chain of command, it was also crisis. Uh, but we always manage to reach agreement, and uh, it uh, sometimes takes time because we need consensus, so this is also important. Uh, there are problems, but you shouldn't uh, overdo, you know. And, uh, well, that's what rumors, Angela Merkel said. But uh, uh, yeah. when you consider what's happened in northern Syria with uh, NATO members, the United States, Turkey, yeah. seemingly not talking to, for example, Emmanuel Macron supposedly found out about the US withdrawal from social media, is that not a crisis? Well, it's a, it's a problematic period, and uh, I can mention even more defense spendings and di different opinions about that, but we're really able to over overcome, I have no doubt. Rumors about death of NATO are strongly exaggerated, to say in short, and we shouldn't uh, play in the hands of our opponents and make them happy, what is obviously happening when they are doing that. So let's just take reality as it is, and I have no doubt, uh, as it was many times ago, uh, we will be able to overcome these difficulties and be stronger. Well, clearly on this side of the Atlantic, there have been lots of public shows of commitment to NATO and particularly smaller states like your own who very much want NATO to be strong. But do you believe that Donald Trump has a strong commitment to NATO? Someone who's been so critical of the alliance in, in recent times. President Trump is uh, well, a special case, I would say, because he's from a businessman. He was never in politics and his maybe way he's saying things and maybe it's unusual. But when we're looking into the bipartisan uh, approach from United States, uh, both parties in the Congress and the meeting leaders, I see see really no gaps. I see no, no, no problems here and totally predictable and continuity, continuity also granted. So let's also be responsible, I would say, on both sides of the ocean, on both sides, not only on the American side, also on the European side, uh, avoiding maybe some questionable initiatives, uh, uh, decreasing this mistrust or, or not, not mm. increasing by some statements. And that will be our common task. I hope we will understand this. And this is, uh, has to do with the leadership, strong leadership, responsible leadership. Mm. And I have no doubt we will be able to, to meet these expectations. Now, uh, in uh, the last few years, particularly, there's been increasing talk about uh, the European Union's own foreign and defence policy. Uh, it's, it's relatively uncoordinated, to be honest, at the moment. Uh, you have said recently that the idea of a European army, which has been much talked about, is weird. I use your word. Uh, why is it weird? Can you expand on that? You know, because I'm, as a former defence minister, I can say that I don't understand what that means. And many, many of my colleagues as well. It was never discussed in any official meeting as an agenda item, by the way. But noise is big. Everybody discussing issue which is not existing. And uh, if we'll talk about better cooperation, fine. If we'll talk about uh, more capabilities, which is really we desperately need it. There are gaps of capabilities, and then Europeans should do more, definitely. But with a big mistake to make it in isolation with the Americans, mm -hmm. uh, to split alliance, mm -hmm. uh, to make it as a competition, as a duplication, it would be wrong politically. It would be wrong, uh, I would say, well, even financially, by the way. Uh, because our taxpayers also should know where their money is going and uh, this money are not sufficient. So all in all, um, I, I, I hope uh, we will be able to understand that everybody will take own responsibility in collective ways mm. and focusing on, on capabilities build, building rather than duplicating our efforts. All right, let's uh, move back to EU internal affairs. Uh, your country uh, joined in this big wave of enlargement. Right now, the EU is looking at the Western Balkans. Uh, many people see the idea of filling in the gaps on the map, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, getting members of the Western Balkans into the European Union. Northern Macedonia and Albania, though, mm. seem to have come up against a bit of a brick wall recently in the form of France and perhaps also the Netherlands. Uh, their accession process blocked. Uh, there have been quite big uh, political gambles made by particularly the leaders of Northern Macedonia to change the name of the country, try and pave the way towards EU accession. Uh, according to Jean-Claude Juncker, it was a historic mistake by the EU member states not to approve the accession process for those two countries. Do you agree with him? I agree. I would say it's historic. It's a strategic mistake. Uh, we should understand that uh, whatever we're doing in conducting our pol pol policy and uh, raising, not just raising expectations to our partners, but also um, uh, cl defining clear benchmarks they, they must reach. Uh, some of them are really very difficult to reach, same as name issue for our Northern Macedonian friends. You know how much time uh, needed. Uh, and uh, they did that at the expense of their political capital, basic, basically. Both countries, Greece and, and Northern Macedonia. And they did that... Uh, they deserved to be part of uh, NATO, I believe, for many years earlier, frankly, so, so technically. But they didn't do that because of that. Mm. European Union, the same case. And now we simply, when they did everything, what mm. they promised to do, 
uh, we're putting them aside due to some reasons which are better to explain to those who decided. So, uh, very well, unfortunately. You, I mean, many people saying that strategically uh, it could be almost dangerous for the European Union to make Northern Macedonia and Albania wait for too long? Do you see other actors moving in Absolutely. to that sphere? Of course. A vacuum never never un unfilled, you know. Always some if some if somebody coming out from the crisis, right? Management theatre, mm. somebody coming in. We see that in Syria, for instance. We also should distinguish a very important thing. I, I can understand this enlargement fatigue when it comes to the factor, de facto membership which is really big requirements and financial and whatever mm -hmm. resources needed. But we are talking about process. We're talking about opening of, uh, you know, accession talks. Same, by the way, let me mention, I will say with the Ukraine and Georgia, they mm -hmm. also would like to get closer. They want to see European perspective, but we sometimes even not able to name that you have European perspective, not mm -hmm. promising anything. Well, I believe we are wrong here. Well, quite. I, recently, I know that you had uh, the Ukrainian filmmaker Oleg Sentsov uh, with you in, in Vilnius. He was jailed in Russia for five years, of course, and received a human rights prize here in the EU. He talked about the EU helping Ukraine to become a more equal partner and said he hopes Ukraine will be admitted to the EU as a member. Now, a lot of people say that's, that's just a, a fantasy. Do you think it's a realistic prospect? Hey, look at us. You know, uh, I was a uh, uh, quarter of century in the politics and I was ambassador, partnership ambassador of NATO, PFP ambassador in Brussels. And up to, to year 2000, I was told by future allies they were saying me, not publicly, but uh, privately. Uh, they said, you know, you will never be members of NATO. You, you are nice, you're personally also not bad, you know, and your freedom fight is also challenging, but you will never be a member because, you know, interests and look at the map, you know. Uh, that was kind of encouragement to us. And it happened, it happened. So I'm saying to my Ukrainian and Georgian friends and others, be patient, keep moving, do reforms, doing for your country, not mm. for somebody else. Time will come, but when time comes, you must, must be ready. If not, you can blame just yourself. I'm afraid that's where we'll have to leave it. But thank you so much for being Appreciate our guest on Talking Europe. Thank you. And that rounds off the programme for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, you can watch uh, this and other episodes online at France24.com as well. Hope to see you soon. Because a new page of history gets written every day. Because breaking news can't wait. Information everywhere. In all situations. On every subject. Understanding the world. Imagining the world. France 24. A different take on the news. Liberté. Égalité. Actualité.